tôi đã đi trại cái tạo Đã bị biệt giam như thế nào Và tôi cũng không bị ai cấm tôi nói Tôi tự do Nhưng mà tôi không muốn chỉ bám vào quá khứ Tôi không muốn ta tháng Nhưng nhìn tương lai Cách tích cực In 75, Van Thuan was appointed by Pope Paul VI as uh, Archbishop Gorgeous of Saigon. And um, at that time, Saigon was in a great turmoil. Obviously, there was um, the communists exalting themselves, you know, in victory. And in the midst of that, millions of people are trying to get out of Vietnam through the last uh, commercial flights and through fishermen boats and the clergy was really in disarray, not knowing what will happen to them. He knew that the communist government would never accept him to be in Saigon, but he headed for Saigon at the time when the, the, the highways are still unsecure. And when he arrived in Saigon, there was nobody to receive him, to welcome him. He knew that there was trouble. Ngày 15 tháng 8, 1975, nhằm lễ Đức Bà hồn xác lên trời là một ngày không thể quên được trong cuộc đời của tôi. Và tôi đã bị bắt ở trong dinh độc lập, chở trên xe, đi trong đêm tối về Nha Trang lúc 12 giờ đêm, một quãng đường Tối tâm thực, nhưng mà tôi vui vẻ bởi vì tôi thấy tôi bắt đầu một bước đường gian lao trong một ngày lễ của Đức Mẹ. Francis Xavier Wen Van Thuan was born in 1928 in Phu Khan, a largely Catholic suburb of Hue in central Vietnam. He was born into a prominent Catholic family with deep ties to the Vietnamese martyrs. Như là lịch sử của giáo hội tại Việt Nam á đã nói rõ là giáo hội Việt Nam được sinh ra ở bằng máu đào của các thánh tử vi đạo Việt Nam ha. Thì từ đầu giáo hội Việt Nam đã bị cấm cách và cái cảnh này đã đã kéo dài 3 3 thế kỷ. À, ba, ba thế kỷ tất cả và chúng tôi có tới uh, hơn ba trăm ngàn người uh, bị tử đạo dưới uh, trong uh, suốt ba thế kỷ này. Van Thuan has always thought that his vocation, his life has been a grace of God, directly linked, intimately linked to the blood of the martyrs. We come from a family where, on my mother's side. My grandfather Ngô Đình Khá's family, the entire village, including his family, was burned alive in the church during worship. And my grandfather was overseas at the time and escaped that. Having survived the martyrdom of his family, Ngô Đình Khá became the heir of a spiritual legacy. But he would also be driven by a political dream of a free and independent Vietnam. He served as the Grand Chamberlain of the court under Emperor Tan Tai and took a principled stand against French colonial rule in Vietnam. Of all his children, it was his daughter Elizabeth who best understood his ideals. Elizabeth was a woman of strong faith, which she passed on to each of her ten children, but in a special way to her eldest son, Tuan. My mother has always told us, each one of us, it doesn't matter what you do, every moment just offered to God, because every moment belongs to God. Thuan took that extremely, extremely seriously, and it was that that kept him, you know, sane and kept him 
in union with God in prison. And he took his entire focus on the present moment and lived that to the limits of his ability to love God. Đưa đến nhà thờ Cây Vông Tôi bị quản thúc ở đó Tôi rất băn khoăn Và một đêm kia Như có một tiếng bảo tôi Tại sao mà con băn khoăn Sao con dại dột như vậy Con cứ làm như Thánh Phao Lô Ông Thánh Phao Lô ở tù Thì ông chỉ viết thơ cho bốn đạo When he was captured In a moment, he lost everything. He had no future, no hope. And he said, I want to use the present moment. I can live it. I can fulfill it with love as Jesus did. And there he understood, I can do something. Like St. Paul, he wrote to his communities. So he succeeded to have some paper. Every night he wrote some lines. You know, to his communities, and through a, a small boy, he could bring it out from the prison. These thoughts were collected, and this is the book, The Road of Hope. He was afraid that he would die, and there was no good left from him to his faithful. And that is why he started writing. This is the... Um very first copy that our family was able to have it printed uh, from on the reflection he wrote in prison, The Road of Hope. He would uh, write his reflection uh, to, on the uh, back of own calendar leaves brought in to him by the Leon boy, Quang, each day. And um, he would collect it and put it in the hands of his sisters and brothers to recopy it and then to circulate it among the Vietnamese as a, a message from the bishop uh, who is in house arrest. Tôi cứ viết sau lưng ấy, cái, cái tờ lịch và cứ tờ này tiếp tờ kia cũng giống là phút này tiếp là tiếp phút kia vậy mà nó thành ra biến sách được hy vọng sống phút hiện tại và làm cho nó đầy tình thương. final battle of Dien Bien Phu that would divide the country in two. The center of Vietnam where we were was extremely poor and neglected financially and especially uh, medically. And Van Thuân was very sick with tuberculosis. Uh, the doctors looked at him and said, we may have to operate you and take half of your lung out because it is very badly infected and the prognosis is very, very poor and that we don't really know what's going to happen. He saw the two surgeons who were about to, to operate on him and they said, let us go and make another uh, X-ray and see what's happened. And they went back and he didn't see any trace of any lung disease. And this. They turned to him and they said, you will live to see all of us buried. Tuan credited the Blessed Mother for his miraculous healing. He was already ordained a priest by the time he traveled to Rome to continue his studies. During his time in Europe, Tuan made a memorable pilgrimage to Our Lady of Lourdes. Lần viếng thứ nhất, đến quỳ cầu nguyện với Đức Mẹ ở Hăng Đá, thì tôi cứ cảm thấy như Đức Mẹ nói với tôi những lời mà Mẹ đã nói với Thánh nữ Bernadette 
mẹ không hứa cho con những hân hoan những sự an ủi mà mẹ hứa cho con những thử thách những khó khăn và hạnh phúc đời sau tôi bị bắt đi cải thảo chừng ấy tôi mới thấy rằng thế thì bây giờ đúng là đức mẹ đã nói trước và đức mẹ đã chuẩn bị cho tôi được thấy điều đó Van Thuan really hesitated talking about the conditions in prison because I think he was so afraid that he may um, incite anger and revenge. And so it is with a lot of hesitation that he described to me uh, the condition of the cell. It is really a very dark, narrow, and uh, airless cell. Most of the time, it's with only one light dangling from the ceiling. And sometimes the light will stay on for months, brightness day and night. And sometimes there will be no light at all. So you are in complete darkness. And at times, as far as uh, degradation, he would be offered food that is extremely salty. And after that, Of course, you are so thirsty and the God would give you a lot of uh, water to drink. And then the day will pass and the night will pass and the God wouldn't come back to open the cell for you to go and relieve yourself. When they come to clean you, they will hose you down and the God may be a female God, completely clean you with a hose wipe, uh, sweep out on the dirt in the cell and calling you with all kinds of names and you call yourself a bishop. This is what you do, you know, and you're ashamed of yourself. And one time he was able to look at that God and said, thank you for cleaning my cell and I am so sorry for being in this condition. And he said the moment that he was able to say that, freedom has come and he was able to start to love. Being a proud man, he would not bend. But he was afraid of that too. That came from his pride. So he prayed to be humble, to look as if he bent. But actually, they could never bend him. Then there is a need of suffering more. Not because he, he liked suffering, but by suffering more, he could help the others. You know, taking the hardest task in a prison camp is to help the others so that they could have a lighter task. Even the Buddhist, even the, the people who never believe in God, pointed to him and said, here comes a saint. Và cầu nguyện những lúc mà vất vả nhất, yếu đuối nhất, không còn đọc kinh gì nữa. Tôi cũng nói với Chúa, Jesus, here, Francis, lại Chúa. Đây con đây, Francisco đây. Và tôi cũng có cảm giác như Chúa Giêsu nói với tôi như Chúa đã nói với ông Jim, Francis, here, Jesus. Tôi nói rằng, there were moments when I was really completely desperate, completely abandoned completely feeling no no one out there cares for me, even perhaps God. And I was in such a weak physical condition that I couldn't even pray the whole Hail Mary. I could just say Hail Mary and that's it. Uh, so my prayers became extremely short. It would be like, um, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Or uh, Jesus, Remember me when you go to your kingdom. Uh, Father, here I am.
có một số bạn hỏi tôi sức mạnh của cha để chịu đựng là gì sức mạnh thì giúp tôi chịu đựng là phép thánh thể when they arrested him the only thing he had with him was the rosary and nothing else so the day after he was allowed uh, to ask for the basic needs and so he sent words that he needed um, medicine for his stomach illness and so the faithful or relatives or anybody understood what he meant by by that is the wine so um, they put in the small bottle the wine and label medicine for stomach illness and then they put the host covered with paper and they put it inside the flashlight for him to see in the dark or in the garden during the night and that's how he continued to celebrate Eucharist and uh, live his priesthood in in prison Mỗi ngày tôi giọt ở trên bàn tay tôi ba giọt rượu và một giọt nước để dâng thánh lễ đó là những thánh lễ quý nhất trong đời tôi và anh em đi lao động với nhau đều biết là có Chúa Giêsu ở với mình điều ấy là điều anh em lấy là hạnh phúc nhất nhiều anh em ở nhà khô đạo vào ấy nên làm tông đồ và cái ơn của Chúa Giêsu thánh thể làm cho anh em biết cư xử có lòng bác ái biết phục vụ các anh em khác và nhờ đó thì có nhiều người không công giáo trở lại đạo The 1954 Geneva Accords ended French colonial rule and partitioned Vietnam into a communist north and a democratic south. Ngo Dinh Ca's son, Zien, became the first president of the Republic of Vietnam. Thuan had a close relationship with his uncle. Growing up, he would spend long days with Diem, climbing the mountains and receiving lessons on Vietnamese history, politics and culture. Ziem was a devout Catholic who had privately taken vows as a Benedictine monk. He treasured those memories of Ngo Dinh Diem. When he was a, still a kid, how he had been laughing when he sat on the shoulder of his uncle and his uncle was walking home from his village to a moving mountain nearby. And during any short vacation he spent with his uncle. He treasured those images um, until his death. After the partition, Ziem tried desperately to keep the country from slipping into a full-blown civil war. He had hopes of uniting the communist north and the democratic south, but in 1963, that dream came to a bitter end. This is a CBS News Extra. This evening, voice circuits were reopened to Saigon, and correspondent Peter Kalischer said that he has now learned beyond a doubt that No Den Diem and his brother Nu were assassinated. In 1963, uh, at the news of the assassination of my two uncles, it was a great moment of darkness and turmoil for all of us. Tuan was in a shock for many, many months. When I came back to Vietnam in 1964, he was still under the shock. But he still was a good listener. You come to him with a story, with some concerns, and he listened to your concern. From time to time, he said, let me walk out a minute. Later on to me, he said, you know what I did? I said, I went out and cried and cried my heart out. He was crying because of, of the death of his uncle and of all of the friends, but he also cried because of the situation of the country. But Van Thuan grieved extremely uh, hard, and at the same time, he had to deal with this um, anger and the revolt and the difficulty to find 
reconciliation and forgiveness. But it precisely at that point that he recognized the spiritual strength of my mother. She kept saying to all of us, you know, they don't know what they do. They don't know what they do and you just have to learn to forgive because it's through forgiveness that you find freedom. Có nhiều lần mấy người gác nó hỏi tôi Ông có ghét tụi tôi không? Nói không Tôi thương các anh chứ Tôi vẫn thương các anh Và dù các anh có muốn giết tôi đi nữa Tôi cũng vẫn thương các anh Mà tại sao? Vì Chúa đã dạy chúng tôi Là phải thương như chính anh em mình vậy Điều đó thì khó hiểu thiệt Nhưng mà nếu tôi không thương các anh Thì chúng tôi chẳng đáng mà gọi là người công giáo. He was warned and found in him a strange guy. This is a guy who had no fear, but no concern for himself. He was always smiling, always say thank you to everything you, you, you did to him. And uh, little by little they, they are gained to his cause. And later on, many of them have been converted by him, actually converted. The government saw that, oh, if you leave them too long with these men, he's going to contaminate them, I mean, beyond friendship. So then they say, we will rotate you. But then Thuan really welcomed that because the more they sent to him, the more he was able to expand his friendship. And so Van Thuan, months after months, were able to dialogue with them to get them to be interested in hearing the story of his life. And these guards started to see that, oh, this man is not very dangerous. They start to develop a certain trust in him. And he found that there was so much conversion, there was so much um, renewal of faith. The spirituality of Cardinal Vantuan was exactly the spirituality of the cross. He was crucified by his suffering, by prison, but he pardoned, as Jesus did, the crucifiers. And so all his work was love and reconciliation. Devo tagliare in legno. E io domando a uno mi permetta di tagliare in legno, un pezzo di legno in forma di croce. Ma perché? Un ricordo. È vietato severamente. Io sarò punito. Chiude le occhi, lasciarmi fare. Lui non può resistere, va via. E così io ho potuto tagliare un pezzo in forma di croce che ho nascosto nel sapone fino alla mia uscita e coperto con un po' di metallo è diventato la mia croce della prigione. E in un'altra prigione vicino a Hanoi, la capitale del Nord Vietnam, io ho domandato a un altro Lei può aiutarmi? Che cosa? Tagliare un pezzo di filo elettrico. Lui mi ha chiesto, lei può suicidarsi? Io dico, no, io devo vivere per combattere voi. <ride> Pochi giorni fa lui è tornato a dirmi, io non posso rifiutare a lei, lei è troppo buono amico. Veramente abbiamo finito in quattro ore questa catena. 
di filo elettrico della prigione. L'amore vince tutto e l'ho provato, voi avete provato. Amen. In 1967, amidst the escalating violence of the Vietnam War, Thuan was appointed Bishop of Nha Trang. He wanted to restore the faith of the people of his diocese who had suffered through decades of bloodshed. Thuan chose joy and hope for his episcopal motto. It was more than a catchphrase. It was a plan of action. That was a quite an irony, because at that time, what we had was sadness and despair. And he wanted to use that motto to make us believe in another kind of dimension, you know. Though we are living the reality of sadness and despair, and if God is with us, there's no, no room for sadness and no room for despair. There's only room for joy and hope. Bishop Francis Tuan was a bishop filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit, aware of it, and yet as humble as the dirt under his shoes. He was a very pious and devout man. He celebrated Mass each day as if it was the only thing he had to do. And he was a, a man of prayer. He was also a man of action. He didn't sit around all day and uh, do nothing or wait for something to happen. But as a matter of fact, he was right there, involved in everything. Father John Pernelli was an American soldier serving in Vietnam when he decided to answer his call to the priesthood. His hope was to serve the church in Vietnam, where he had fallen in love with the people and the culture. Bishop Tuan accepted him into his diocese. From that moment on, a lifelong friendship was born. The situation for the church during the war was, was at best, could be described difficult, um, and no bishop needed uh, to have an American seminarian hanging around. He had enough to do to deal with the Viet Cong and so on. So he had a perfect reason, uh, and a valid reason, if you wanted to look at it that way, to say to me, you're a fine young man, now will you please go home and get out of here? But he didn't do that. He was willing to take the, the risk and the chance, and he certainly showed no hesitation. I think one of the reasons I became so attached to him is that he understood very clearly the role of the bishop, to be a unifier, to be a leader, to be the one to call the people together, to give them direction. He did that, and he did it eminently well. Tuan brought in lay movements to breathe new life into his diocese. He created democratically elected parish councils and more than tripled the number of seminarians studying in Nha Trang. It was a race against time as Tuan tried to prepare his diocese for the inevitable fall of South Vietnam into the hands of the communists. One of the reasons why the communists hated him is because he was such a charismatic and gifted leader in the Catholic Church. He was certainly a marked man, and I believe I could say that he realized it and he knew his day was coming. He was not at all naive. An example of that I would cite is a speech he made to the Sisters of St. Paul of Chartres, oh, a few years before the fall of Vietnam into the hands of the communists. And in that speech, he told the sisters, times will get tough. Maybe you will not be allowed to live in the convent. Maybe you will not be allowed to wear the religious habit. Maybe you will not be allowed to have various apostolates. He said, we bishops will go to prison. He said, that's the job of the bishop. They did it to St. Paul, they did it to St. Peter. He said, and they certainly will do it here too. Ở Trại Phúc Khánh, ngày đêm, tôi nghe tiếng chuông nhà thờ chính tòa Nha Trang. Một thời gian đã là nhà thờ chính tòa là địa phận của tôi, 
mà tôi rất thương mến Mỗi ngày chuông đánh bao nhiêu lần Thì tôi nhớ thương giáo dân địa phận bấy nhiêu lần Tôi cứ băn khoăn mãi, thao thức mãi Và thấy tan nát cả lòng Bởi vì tôi không làm gì được cho giáo dân Và một đêm Một tư tưởng rất rõ Như có tiếng nói Nói với tôi Làm cho tôi thấy sáng tỏa trước con mắt tôi Con đừng dạy nữa Con phải biết phân biệt Chúa và công việc của Chúa In prison one of the things that he missed the most is his people the people of his diocese and he suffered from it so much that he turned to God and said what is this I cannot do anything for my people and in the darkness of his jail He finally heard the answer. I was on the cross. And at that time, it looked like I had nothing. I couldn't do anything for anybody. And yet, it was at that moment that I saved the world. And realizing that, he knew that there are two things. There is God's love and God's work. Jesus forsake was the star which could bring light to his personal forsakenness into prison. He lived a very extreme situation. Many times he underlined that he was not only 13 years in the prison, but nine years completely isolated in a small cell, often without light, hot, without future, without hope. In this situation, he could identify himself with Jesus in his forsakenness. Somehow he, he got a window of canonization of 117 martyrs in Rome through one of his wardens. And uh, the day of the canonization, he started singing Te Deum. And I think that later on, he taught his, uh, his uh, prison wardens to sing Te Deum with him. <laughs> When Pope John Paul uh, canonized the Vietnamese martyrs, and back in his cell, he said he really meditated on the message of the martyrs He said, the martyrs taught us to say yes to unconditional love for Christ, to give your life unconditionally, with no limits, to be faithful to the gospel, but to say no to all forms of flattery, all, to say no to all forms of compromise, even to safeguard your life. Tôi thấy tôi cũng được nhiều ơn Đức Mẹ trong khoảng thời gian ấy. Khi ở tù, tôi có cầu nguyện với Đức Mẹ. Lại Đức Mẹ, nếu mẹ thấy con không làm được gì ích cho hội thánh nữa, thì xin Đức Mẹ cho con được chết ở trong tù này để con làm cho trọn lễ hy sinh của con. Ngược lại, nếu mẹ thấy con có thể làm được cái điều gì mà có ích cho hội thánh thì xin mẹ cho con được chết trong được ra khỏi tù trong một ngày lễ của mẹ điều thách đố ấy tôi cứ hy vọng là thế nào đức mẹ cũng cho mà. Hello? 
It is uh, like a dream. Everybody told me last uh, yesterday in Hanoi, it is a dream. Nobody can imagine that. And I'm good health now. My father was too emotional to get on the phone. My, my, my mother was very strong, and so she stayed around that phone. And when it rang, it was Van Thuan over the other side, and it was a moment of silence because it was so emotional. And finally, he said to them that he was free, that he was in good health. He asked whether he could obtain uh passport to go and visit with his family in Australia. They granted him the passport and he told his sister um, that not to divulge that to his parents because he may at the last minute be detained by the communists. So they um, surprised the parents when he arrived in Australia and show up at his parents' place. My sister Anne simply said to her own family, oh, at three o'clock, a Monsignor from the apostolic delegation would come and visit you, mom and dad, so would you be up then from your siesta? So of course, my dad and mom would say, of course. And they were on their best outfit and ready to visit uh, with this Monsignor. And when the door opened, it was Francis. It was a different Francis. It was a older and thinner Francis. And so my dad still was in shock. So he was still saying, oh, please come in, Monsignor. Not realizing that that was Van Thuan, his son. It is my mother who recognized right away. And he said, oh, thank you. Oh my God, oh my God, you are still alive. It's really you, it's really you. Tôi thấy một cái sự thay đổi rất là là là, là lớn. À, trước đây với lại sau 13 năm năm tù, à, sau đó thì trong cái cuộc à, nói, nói chuyện với tất cả các anh chị em lên tu sĩ Việt Nam ở Roma này, thì ngài đã à, cho biết à, như, một một số những cái 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 cái, đề, cái điểm chính, à, không có nói gì về vấn đề chính trị hay những về khác mà nói về những điều 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 chính chính yếu rồi. À, nhưng mà ngài vẫn trong cái buổi đầu tiên đó thì ngài đã thông truyền cho chúng tôi cái 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 cái, cái, cái tinh thần để mà sống những cái trong những cái cuộc đau khổ trong những khi. In 1989, a sudden downturn in global communism worried Vietnamese officials. They gave Tuan an ultimatum: sacrifice your leadership role in the church or leave the country. In 1991, Tuan was exiled to Rome he would never return to Vietnam. I ho conosciuto il cardinale quando lui venne a Roma dopo la sua liberazione. E devo dire che per lui quei primi anni fu un periodo molto di solitudine perché non aveva niente da fare. Era distaccato dal suo paese. Lui continuava a vivere con il cuore in Vietnam. Lui aveva lasciato il suo cuore in Vietnam fino alla fine. Living in exile, Tuan was initially hesitant to speak about his time in prison. He feared that revealing too much would anger the communist authorities and prevent any chance of returning home. It was something his mother said that changed his mind. One time, my mother said, you know, Tuan, your life is not your life, it belongs to God. So if you present your life and all the graces that God has given you and how much strength you have taken from the Eucharist, maybe you can shed more faith and more light and more courage for other people who may learn from that. And Van Tuan really meditated very much on that before really going out of his way to share with others about his life. Tuan drew close to the growing international Vietnamese community. He traveled the world speaking to large audiences 
bringing a message of hope and forgiveness. C'è una parola che descrive la spiritualità del cardinale, la parola speranza. Ha perduto tutto. La diocesi, i parenti, gli amici, tutto. Però non ha mai, avendo Dio dentro di sé, non ha mai perduto né la gioia né la speranza. In 1994, accepting the fact that Tuan would never be allowed to return to Vietnam, Pope John Paul II appointed him Vice President of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Four years later, he became the President. Certo, per lui la giustizia e la pace non erano slogan, ma erano realtà profondamente sofferte. Io vengo da un paese che ha sofferto di quasi 40 anni di guerra. Allora capisco la sofferenza della gente che hanno sofferto nella guerra. Le sofferenze non nella teoria ma nella mia carne. È per questo che io penso alla giustizia. Alla giustizia e pace. Of course. The, the normal activity of meetings and the seminars uh, was going on. But his main activity, I would say, was the message that his person was spreading of a martyr, of a, a hero. Lui preparava dei testi anche molto impegnativi, però vedevo che dopo due o tre pagine e li lasciava da parte e raccontava la sua storia, la sua prigionia e la raccontava sempre con grande senso della misura e dell'umor e la gente restava conquistata non dal testo della conferenza ma dal racconto della sua vita fatta sempre con grande amabilità, con grande semplicità. Era un, uomo, era un uomo affascinante sotto questo punto di vista. That was very much privileged because I had the office right across the hall from his. I got the sense that his heart and his mind had been formed, first of all, by being a priest, by being a Christian. And the experiences he had in prison really sharpened that um, and tempered his faith to the extent that it became mature. Those of us who were lucky enough and, and blessed to work with him, we got to see another side of him. For example, he was a very good cook. Um, he liked to cook Vietnamese food for his friends. Um, he could tell jokes. He could impersonate um, John Paul II, Cardinal Sodano, at the drop of a hat. He could uh, impersonate the staff, the way we walked, the way we talked. He knew exactly how to imitate somebody. He's very much a person who puts you at ease. He's very much a person who, who makes you smile. Tuan enjoyed a close relationship with Pope John Paul II. Both men had been formed through personal sufferings under totalitarian regimes, and both dreamed of a church renewed through hope. In the year 2000, John Paul asked Tuan to preach the Lenten spiritual exercises for him and the Roman Curia. It was the first time in history an Asian bishop had received such an honor. The Pope said to him, this year the Pope and the Curia would listen to a Vietnamese archbishop talking about their faith. And Tuan said, I'm scared. A Holy Father, I do not know what to talk about. I'm not a great theologian, and I, I do not know what I could really say. And the Pope said, talk about yourself. Talk about your experience, especially your experience in prison. He had to prepare 22 meditations. I had the occasion to be like a secretary for this work, uh, typewriting. I remember sometimes he read again a text, and he said, no, it's not yet beautiful. And so he went over again. He took scissors, 
and he put it together with glue. And one day he commented, uh, we are working with uh, scissors and glue, but in reality, that's the Lord who does everything. At the conclusion of the spiritual retreat, it was exactly the 24th anniversary of the date when he started solitary confinement. And he said, I could not believe that 24 years ago I was saying mass with three drops of wine in that dark cell away from everybody. And 24 years later, I'm here celebrating mass in the heart of Vatican and in front of the Pope. It was a beautiful day. The Roman sky was really perfect blue. And um, when uh, his name was called, and you could see that he was slowly marching up and climbing up the steps towards uh, the Pope. And I was just imagining my grandfather and all these martyrs and all my ancestors all around present there to say, yes, you know, our lives, our sacrifice, God has listened to us. And this is um, really the message to Vietnam. God loves you. He was kept um, humble by his mom. For her, he was always only a priest. And he became a bishop. He said, Mom, I will become a bishop. She said, so you will be a priest with some more power some more responsibility. And he, when he, he became cardinal, he told his mom about it. And she said, so what? You would still be a priest, a little more, you know, responsibilities. In a way, I would say he probably took the opportunity of becoming a cardinal to show even more so how simple and basic the Christian faith is. There were probably fewer heirs about him there was certainly no arrogance about him. To him, this is just another way of expressing the hope that he's always carried inside of his heart. Io direi vivevo in un modo semplice perché era un uomo ricco, ricco interiormente, ricco di fede, ma anche e soprattutto ricco di esperienze umane. Era un uomo in un certo aspetto Come dice la scrittura, era un principe di Dio. Era un gran principe e non aveva bisogno del lusso. The day before the consistory, he saw me and he said, um, I don't have very good news. And I said, what happened? And he said, uh, the test came back and uh, they fear that there are some cancer cells. He knows he has the cancer, doesn't matter. He confronted the cancer with peace and hope. One day in the hospital bed, I recall, he told me, I still have one work to accomplish. I have to accept the death with a smile because it is the task of God. In his last few months in this world, whenever we saw him, we saw that he was bathed in a kind of light, which was almost unnatural. And he told me, sufferings is another way to do evangelization. He would celebrate Mass in this hospital, small room, and we would be in the corridor looking in because if we all are together with him, it's not enough air for him. And he was struggling to breathe. And with a smile, he said, oh no, come in, everybody. It is." a place when we want Jesus in our midst. 
It was such an emotional moment for me because those were the days when he was nearing death and he still wanted to make that effort to instill in us the faith in the importance of the Eucharist. alimentata della preghiera e della sofferenza accettata con amore. In carcere celebrava ogni giorno l'Eucaristia con tre gocce di vino e una goccia d'acqua nel palmo della mano. Era questo il suo altare, la sua cattedrale, During the homily for the funeral mass, John Paul II took a line from one of Cardinal Van Tuan's books, which talked about when the cardinal was saying mass with a few drops of wine and a, and a very, very small piece of bread, how the palm of his hand became his altar and became his cathedral. I, I still get goosebumps when I, when I think about that, because here we are at St. Peter's Basilica, this marvelous, baroque, fantastic building. You're comparing that to what Cardinal Van Tuan had in his hand in a box in Vietnam. And it's not the building, it's not the statues, it's not even the fact that the saints are buried there that makes it a great place. It's the fact that Christ is there. And that, that is something that can be held in the palm of your hand. In the enveloping darkness of prison, Cardinal Wen Van Tuan once wrote, a straight line consists of a million points joined together. A lifetime consists of millions of seconds and minutes joined together. If every point along the line is rightly set, the line will be straight. If every minute of life is good, that life will be holy. The road of hope is paved with small acts of hope along life's way. When Francis Xavier Wynne Van Tuan was ordained bishop on June 24, 1967, he chose as his motto the title of the Second Vatican Council's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope, because he desired to be an apostle of joy and hope. As we have seen and heard in this documentary, these words were more than a catchphrase, they were a plan of action, a way of life for him. On November 21st, 1988, Feast of the Presentation of Mary in the Temple, Archbishop Van Tuan was released from a 13-year imprisonment. In 1991, he was banished from his homeland, but it was, in a certain sense, Van Tuan's presentation to the Universal Church and to the whole world. The Cardinal's final project was to organize the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, his life's crowning achievement. This monumental work is a tribute to the life, suffering, passion, and death of Francis Xavier Wynne Van Tuan. It is a unique, unprecedented document in the history of the Church, serving as a tool to inspire and guide the faithful who are faced with moral and pastoral challenges daily. Cardinal Renato Martino, successor to Van Tuan at the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, wrote in the preface of the compendium completed only after Van Tuan's death, quote, This work carries therefore the seal of a great witness to the cross who remained strong in faith in the dark and terrible years of Vietnam, end of quote. My first encounter with Archbishop Van Tuan took place in the offices of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace in the Vatican's Palazzo San Calisto in late 1999. While in Rome for meetings, 
I stopped to visit my former student and friend, Kishore Jayabalan, staff person at the Council for Justice and Peace, who testified so eloquently in this documentary. Having arrived earlier than expected, I was ushered into a waiting area at the Council and sat down. Shortly afterward, a kind Asian priest entered and greeted me. Surely he was one of the Monsignore and staff who came to say hello, so I thought. The cleric was so interested in this stranger from Canada that I never had a chance to ask him his name or his role at the council. He radiated simplicity and joy. We sat on a bench in the hallway for a good half hour and continued talking about many things until Kishore arrived and found me deep in conversation with this Monsignore. Finalmente, you're here for your friend, the Monsignore chided Kishore. We parted and Kishore and I had a great visit. I distinctly recall saying to him, by the way, I'm sorry I didn't have the opportunity to meet and speak with your boss, that Vietnamese archbishop who's been in the papers lately. Kishore looked at me puzzled and said, who do you think you were speaking to for the half hour before I arrived? That's Archbishop Van Thuan. I was stunned. What warm humanity and simplicity. What obvious and contagious joy. At the age of 74, Cardinal Van Thuan died of cancer on September 16, 2002, in a clinic in Rome. He was once a prisoner, but ended his life as a prince of the church. In his second encyclical, Spe Salvi, Saved by Hope, Pope Benedict XVI writes, The late Cardinal Huynh Van Thuan, a prisoner for 13 years, nine of them spent in solitary confinement, has left us a precious little book, Prayers of Hope. During 13 years in jail, in a situation of seemingly utter hopelessness, the fact that he could listen and speak to God became for him an increasing power of hope, which enabled him, after his release, to become for people all over the world a witness to hope, to that great hope which does not wane even in the nights of solitude. For Cardinal Fantoine, Justice and peace, joy and hope were not slogans or politically correct jargon, but the DNA, the reality of his life that was born of blood, sweat, tears, suffering, and forgiveness. Perhaps this is what Tertullian was speaking about when he wrote, Our numbers increase every time we are cut down by you. The blood of martyrs is the seed of new Christians. Producer David Nalieri and the Salt and Light team have produced a moving documentary through the generosity of Cardinal Fantoine's people, his family in Vietnam, Australia, and Canada, his devoted Salatinian sisters of St. Mary in Cologne, Germany, his countless friends in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Our documentary would have never been possible without the untiring devotion and love of Cardinal Fantoine's sister, Elizabeth Wynne of Windsor, Ontario, and the Supreme Council of the Knights of Columbus in the United States. Now that the Cardinal's cause for beatification has begun, it is our sincere hope that the story we have told will move viewers across the world to pray to Cardinal Francis Xavier Win Van Thuan, who is now returned to his heavenly homeland, where he will never know imprisonment, violence, and exile again. May the humble yet great Vietnamese Cardinal intercede for us, inspire us and strengthen us as we strive to bring joy and hope, justice and peace, forgiveness and truth to our contemporary world. Yeah.